Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Blueprint Online. We're so excited to be watching with all of you today so we can kick off Father's Day right here together because this is family. And I know we've got dads from all different stages of fatherhood watching today, so we just want you to know that you're awesome, you're loved, and you're appreciated. Today is your day, and we hope you enjoy it to the fullest. Now, fam, if you got a dad in the room, show him some love. Now families, if you have kids, make sure you go to blueprintchurch.tv slash online for all of the Blueprint Kids resources so they can have church today too. There's everything you need from worship videos, lesson videos, and interactive activities, so parents, make sure to check it out. If you don't know, here at Blueprint, we believe that generosity is normal. So we get excited about giving around here. We get excited about our tithe and our offerings. So you can go right now to blueprintchurch.tv slash give for your tithe and for your offering. Because listen, God is so incredibly generous. Romans 8 says that he gave his only son for us. So how will he not also freely give all things. This is the heart that God has for us in our lives. And he wants to meet every need that we have. He wants to be able to use us even to be generous in the lives of the people around us. Our obedience and our tithe and our offering opens the door to that in our lives. And I know for my husband and I, we believe that everything we have already came from him. So this is just another way that we get to honor God with what he's given us. Let's go ahead and pray over our giving this morning. God, we just thank you that you're awesome and that you're amazing and you have such a huge heart for us, God, that you want to see every need in our lives met, God, and you want to see us to be able to bless the people around us even, God, to just be used by you. So Lord, we just thank you right now that we just have an opportunity to honor you with our giving, God, to just be obedient with what you've asked us to do in our tithe and our offering this morning, God, and we just pray, Lord, that you're just blessing people as they're just being obedient to what you've ask them to do. And we just thank you for how awesome and how generous you are, even in our lives, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, y'all. Hope you guys are ready. Hope you got your coffee. Let's do this. Church, I am so excited to be here. Real deal live. This is live. There's people here in the room at 10 o'clock in the morning. This is not recorded. I've been looking forward to this all week. I wanted to be with you live, L-I-V-E, live on Father's Day. So first off, happy Father's Day to all the fathers 
watching with us. Let's welcome all the fathers. Come on, guys. We actually have a few people in the room this morning. We're so glad you're here. If you're watching with a dad, how about you just tell him he's appreciated. Give him some love. If you're away from your dad today, reach out to him. Uh, tell him you love him. Just tell him you appreciate him. Let all the fathers in your life, whether it's a biological, adopted, spiritual, just let them know they're loved and they're appreciated today. And from me to you, dads, I want you to know that I appreciate you. Uh, you have a hard job sometimes, uh, oftentimes a thankless job. And I know that now because I've got kids of my own. I've got a four-year-old and a two-year-old and I always figured it wouldn't be easy while I was watching other people father their kids. And uh, now I know for sure it can take it out of you sometimes. It can wear you down. And I mean, I wouldn't trade my kids for anything. They're great. August and Amaris, I think you're actually watching this morning with mom. So, hey, it's good to see you guys. And I love you. But I, I, you guys know we have a great heavenly father. I was actually blessed with a really great earthly father. I just want to honor him today too. Uh, thanks for being a great dad and, and doing things that I did not express any appreciation for for so many years, uh, but I just took for granted. But I just want to tell you, thank you. Uh, blessed to have you as my dad and in my life. And uh, you guys know, all of you watching that have kids, blessing are our children for sure, but man, they can, they can take it out of us. So uh, I hope for you dads today, I just want you to know you are appreciated even if uh, you don't hear that all the time. You are, and I hope you can enjoy today. It's Father's Day. Like, Take some time to just drink it in and let people love on you. Be appreciated and know that you're doing better than you think. So you're doing better than you think, dads. And I know right now that you are in a battle. And it's a battle. I feel like uh, as dads, a lot of times we feel like we can't win. Uh, it's, it's a battle that never ends. You know, do I spend time with my kids or do I get some work done? Do I focus on my faith? or on my finances? Do I focus on my family or my finances? Should I go win the bacon or should I go watch my boys ball game? Like it just feels like I'm making choices all the time and I'm in this battle where even if I feel like I'm winning at some things, it feels like I'm losing at others. It feels like I can, I can have a victory in this area, but it feels like I'm just defeated in this other area. And as a dad, it's something I feel all the time. You know, if I, if I go provide for my family, I'll never get to see my kids. If I stay at home like they say, then I lose that extra shift. And then we can't go on the vacation that I know they really want. And then they, uh, they don't understand that I really got to pay bills. They want me here, but they want me to work. And what do I do? I feel like I can't win for losing. And I feel like I'm just on this treadmill and I, I go this way and go this way. And I just don't know how to win. Today, I want to encourage the dads. And I hope today is encouraging to you. And I hope that when you leave today, you know that the power, even one encouraging word can carry. So would you pray with me this morning as we get into God's word? Lord, in the name of Jesus, we come to you, Father, a good God, a God who has good plans for us, a God who only wants the best for us, who sees us as we can be. First off, Lord, we thank you for who you are today. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for creating us and molding us in exactly the form you wanted us to be. I pray today, Lord, as we get into your word, that you would open our hearts to receive it in the way only you can move in our hearts. Holy Spirit, open our eyes spiritually. Open our hearts to receive your word because your words are life to me. I want what you say. I want more than what I hear on the news, more than what I hear. Even my own friends may be telling me and my boss telling me, Lord, I want to hear what you say about me. And Lord, I pray that we can be an encouraging people and use the words that you've put in our mouths to be like the words that you've given to us, Lord, exhorting that they're real, that they're life-giving. And I pray that you would do all these things in the name of Jesus. If you agree with that, say amen. 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 So we are live today. And uh, so it might feel a little bit different. I like having a few people in the room uh, a lot of people in here are, are actual families, so there's going to be some like social distancing, some not. I don't know what you can actually see on the screen, but everybody here, would you welcome everybody once again live if you're coming in just a little late with us. We're glad you're here this morning. We've got a lot of moving parts, and before I get into the message, we gave a shout out to Robbie Hall uh, in the pre thing we do at 945. If you don't know, Every week you should join us at 945 because that's actually when we go live. And we have this amazing person as part of our church. And he's got a lot of extra today especially. But 
Robbie Hall, ladies and gentlemen, has <laughs> made a lot of things happen. And we just want to acknowledge him, encourage him, and uh, go ahead and say a quick prayer for him if you're at home, because I know like he's still doing a lot of things that you can't see off screen right now to make all of this happen live. And I'm going to get my notes pulled up here. All this is live, so everything's kind of be kind of different. I'm excited. If you got a Bible, get to the book of Job today. J-O-B, Job. Open up that Blueprint app if you got it there. We're going to be in chapter 16. It's where we're going to start. And I would usually, uh, if I was, you know, here on this stage or, gosh, anywhere just telling you in life, I'm, I'm usually a guy that would tell you uh, don't compare yourself to anybody because comparison is a thief of joy. Yeah. It's, it's what steals our joy, what steals our contentment. And especially in our culture, I feel like it's a cancer that is attacking our self-worth. You know, you see people, you see all these different things. But for a moment, I want to give you license to compare yourself to my friend here in the Bible, Job. I want you to set yourself up next to Job because whatever you are going through right now, I can almost guarantee you don't have it as bad as Job. Now, if you've never read this Old Testament book, if you go to the middle of your Bible, if you actually have a physical Bible, you know the one with actual pages. They still make those. You, you can read those at home. You open it up to the middle of your Bible, you'll find Job right about in the middle. And Job is this man who was righteous before God. He was highly blessed. He was wealthy. And with Job, um, the, the gist of the whole story at the beginning is he has all of these things ripped away from him in the matter of one day. All of his sons and daughters die. All of his herds are killed. And um, everything, his wealth, all of the things that would make him um, have a claim in the eyes of the world, literally in one day, stripped away. And here you find Job uh, with his wife still in the picture, but even his wife is saying, curse God and die. Um, you know, you want to lean on your wife a little bit. And she's saying, you know, you just need to go. This is what Job's facing. This is Job in his situation. So I want you to think about what you're going through because I know we're all facing battles today and I don't know what you're facing, but this is what Job's going through. It's very real. It's very heart-wrenching. Now, one of the things that was going on right after it, while he's in the middle of mourning and experiencing all of this loss, now he starts to get these boils on his skin. He starts to have these festering sores all over his body, these scabs that would peel off. He's having nightmares, feverish all the time. He's experiencing these crazy amounts of pain. This is what Job is sitting in. This is his life. He goes from extremely blessed to literally the hardest thing he's walking through in his entire life. But one redeeming thing in the middle of this is that he's got friends. How many of you know we need some friends? He's actually got people in his life that care about him. And you know, we all need this. We all need community. We all need relationship. This is why over and over and over again, we stress so importantly how big small groups are here at Blueprint. This is not like family, y'all. This is not like that. It is family. We need real relationship with each other. I, I think about Job and I think, man, how hard this would be, but how hard it must have been uh, if he didn't have anybody to even comfort him in his pain. See, he actually has friends. He has friends show up and he is able to walk with these people. He's able maybe at another time in his life to celebrate with these people. But right now, these people come to grieve with him. And I can identify with what he's going through because I've gone through battles. I know in, even in our own church, I have a small group of men that I meet with every single week that I'm able to be open with that I'm able to be transparent with. And we celebrate together. We talk about family things. I talk about struggles that I have. You know, I'm still a man. I'm not Superman. You know, before I was a pastor, I actually was a man and, <laughs> and still am. And life's still not easy all the time. I share struggles with them. I share what we're going through. They do the same thing with me. And we walk through this thing together. Well, Job has these friends. They show up. And after they hear about all that has happened to him, they show up and they just sit with him. Here's a man full of faith, still not going back on his commitment to God, not going back on anything that he said he would be about. His faith is still the middle of his life. But here a man who was once full of faith, full of blessing that was very obvious in his life. Now, the Bible says he's lost almost everything that's mattered to him, and they don't even recognize him. 
when they show up. They begin to weep with him. And the Bible says for seven days and seven nights, his friends just sat there with him, not even saying a word. Because sometimes your presence is all that matters. Sometimes your presence is the most important thing. You don't have to say a word to show up and show that you actually care. Dads, your presence matters more than you know. Sometimes you feel like you don't know what to do. Just show up. Just be there. Sometimes you don't know how to fix something. Just show up. Just be there. Your kids see that you're trying. They see the effort that you're putting forth, and it matters more than you know. So Job's friends show up, and he's in the middle of this biggest battle that he's ever gone through in his life. They don't even recognize him at first, but they sit with him. They mourn with him. But then they start to talk. <laughs> That's where they messed up. They were doing really good <laughs> until they opened their mouth. Can anybody identify with that? Come on. <laughs> Well-intentioned, though they may be, it's when they started to speak that they did the damage. So Job's boys get here. They're comforting him by just being with him. But then they start saying things like, hey, this is all your fault. You see all this stuff that's going on in your life around you? It's because of what you've done. It's because of all the sin in your life. It's because you're jacked up and you've messed up and it just keeps on going. This, this, and this. Hey, you see how this thing messed up? Your fault. You see how you lost this? You know it all goes back to you and just negative, 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 negative. I got enough of that in my life. Like, I get that on my news feed. I get it on the actual news. I get it at work. I hear it from my boss. I get it on the drive home. I got it all over my life. I don't need all this negative now from my friends when they show up coming at me with all that. Now, I don't want you to hear me wrong because we all need friends that will tell us the truth. That's good. Right. Come on. Right. Don't hear your pastor say, oh, my friend's being mean to me. I don't need to be friends with him no more. Not what I'm saying. That might be your best friend. <laughs> <laughs> they might actually be telling you the truth. We need people to walk with us who love us enough to tell us the truth, who help us to see things when we don't see them. If we're being crazy and we don't even realize it, a good friend will tell you and help bring you back on track. That's not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about in Job's case, he's done nothing wrong. This is a little different. I mean, let's be really honest. Can I get really honest? This is live. There's no going back now. A lot of us don't want relationship because we don't want accountability. It's not that we don't have time or can't make it happen because you know you have time. I know how many shows you watch on Netflix. I know what you do with your life. I'm telling you, you got time. But the real reason you don't want good friends is because you don't want anybody telling you what to do. You don't want anybody calling you out. This is, this is getting live. This is real. We can't go back. So I'm just going to get back to my notes. If that's for you, you know it's for you. God moving their heart. Forgive me. If I'm calling them out, and I shouldn't be. <laughs> All right. So don't hear me wrong here. We're not saying that you don't need friends to tell you the truth. That's what I don't want you to hear. This is different because in this case, Job actually hasn't done anything wrong. Job has not sinned before God. This is not Job did something wrong and the recourse was God punished him by taking it away. That's not the case. Satan has come into Job's life, the enemy of his soul has come in and is wrecking things. And now Job's friends are the ones accusing him, even as the accuser himself is wreaking havoc in his life. That's the situation we see. It's sad. I don't know if I want friends like Job's friends. That's not the kind of friends I want to have. Finally, chapter 16, I hope you're there by now. In Job chapter 16, Job finally speaks up. He kind of comes back after he's heard all this different stuff from his friends. And they've gone on chapter upon chapter upon chapter. And starting in verse 2, Job says this, I've heard many things like these. He said, I've, I've heard all the things you've said about me. I've heard all the accusations. I've heard all the things you told me I'm not good at. I've heard you tell me how since I did this, I deserve this. I've told you, I've heard you tell me all these things that I've done wrong. But he says, I've heard you say many things like these. You are miserable comforters, all of you. You ever wanted to say this? You ever like got any friends like this? You want to say, look, 
this uh, comforting thing, you really suck at it. Like you're not, you're not good at this. Uh, maybe, I'm, maybe it's just me. He continues. He says, will your long-winded speeches never end? What ails you that you keep on arguing? I could also speak like you if you were in my place. In other words, if the tables were turned, I could also do this. I could come at you with all your faults, all the things that you're not great at. I could just be throwing them at you when you're at your lowest, while you're down, just kicking you. I could be doing that same thing too. He says, I could make fine speeches against you and shake my head at you. But listen to what he says. This is so good. Verse five, Job says, but my mouth would encourage you. Comfort. Everybody say comfort. comfort. Comfort from my lips would bring you relief. Job says, if it were me, if I was in your shoes and the table returned, this is what I would be doing. I'd be comforting you. I would encourage you. I would strengthen you. I would comfort you with the words from my mouth, not only with my presence, but with my words. I'd be speaking life-giving things. I'd build you up. I'd be speaking words of encouragement because the words that we speak, guys, are so powerful. So powerful. Proverbs 18, 21 says it like this. The tongue has what? The power of life and death. The tongue has the power of life and death. See, our words can build up or our words can kill. They can destroy people or they can help them become who they're created to be. See, I can cause wounds or I can heal wounds. Job says, again, if it were me, I would use my words to encourage you, to strengthen you, to bring you relief. Here's what I would want you to know. If you were in my shoes, I'd want you to know that God's still for you, that he still loves you, that he has a plan for you. That's what I would be telling you. See, I don't have to even know all the details of what's gone wrong to know that you need encouragement. I don't have to be your best friend and know all of your good parts and your flaws to come in and know that you're in a battle and that you need somebody to encourage you. Why? Because we all need encouragement. All of us need encouragement in our lives. We all need it. Now, Hebrews 3, 13 says it this way, and I, I want to give you a minute because I want you to read this together with me. Hebrews 3 we're just looking at one verse, verse 13. I want you to find it. I want to read this together with you. I'm reading out of the NIV today. You there? Yeah. If, you're in, if you're in the chat, say I'm there. You got that real Bible open, the blueprint app. You got the blueprint app, it's just there for you. <laughs> Hebrews 3, 13. It says, but encourage one another when? Oh, wow. when you're on top of the world? Mm -hmm. No. When you're feeling all nice. How about when my new outfit's really popping and my hair's on point, so I feel good about myself, so I'm ready to encourage you. No, it says, but encourage one another. When? Daily. Daily. Now, that's every day. That means we encourage each other every single day. That's what we do for somebody else. That's in the valley and when we're experiencing victory. That's in triumph and defeat. That's when we're going through persecution. Or let's make this uh, more, um, I guess, culturally relevant. When you're going through injustice and when you're experiencing victory, we're still encouraging each other. No matter what season we are in, we are encouraging each other. How often? Daily. Daily. Every single day. And encouragement isn't about you. Oh, I think we need to say that one out loud. <laughs> I think we need to say that one. Okay, let's say this all together. Let's say, encouragement isn't about me. Encouragement, encouragement, isn't, about encouragement me. isn't about me. Encouragement is about somebody else. It's about building up somebody else. It's reminding them who they are in Christ. It's reminding them who they're created to be, who they're actually called to be, who God has shaped them to be. I'm building somebody else up when I encourage. It's for somebody else. We encourage each other daily, and it goes on, as long it is, as it is called today, why? Well, so that. I love these so that statements in, in the Bible throughout the New Testament. You see, well, why would we do this? Well, this is exactly why. Why do we encourage people daily? Well, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. 
Mm. So we encourage each other every single day. Why? So that we're not hardened our hearts by sin's deceitfulness. Because what does sin do? Sin deceives. Sin promises something great and never delivers. Sin lies. It makes us think that we could do something better apart from God. It makes us think that if we did it differently without God in our lives, it would actually yield something better than Him in our lives. And since sin is always around us, since it's always a temptation, since the enemy is always coming at you with something, it's this constant encouragement from one another that helps us keep our eyes fixed on God and on actually walking out this call that we have in Christ. It's that constant encouragement that helps us from falling into deception or unbelief or distraction. It's that constant encouragement from everybody else. Now, I don't know about you, but that's something I need every day. I need that every day. It's without fail, at some point in the day, some thought will cross my mind that says, you're not good enough, or you're just not going to get this done, or you're not going to be able to do this the way it needs to be done. You're not going to do this at the level somebody else could. And without fail, through the day, these discouraging thoughts, these things that want to bring me down, are firing away at me. Now, that's why encouragement daily is so big. Now, I don't know about you other fathers, dads, humans that are watching. If you experience this self-talk or you latch on to something somebody says. Somebody can say, 10 people say 10 great things to you. And what's the one thing we remember? That one critical thing that somebody tells us. 12 people build us up, one brings us down, and we just sit there on it. And we, and we focus on it. Well, maybe I'm not good enough. Maybe I'm not actually cut out for this. Maybe, maybe I should just give up. But it's this encouragement that makes all the difference. Like, I get an encouraging word from somebody, and it makes all the difference in the world. It makes such a huge difference. Now, I've got this friend named Andrew Hall. Andrew Hall is a freaking boss. This guy is a good dad. Ari and Piper, if y'all are watching, y'all just need to know your dad's awesome, and you are blessed to have Andrew Hall as your daddy. But this guy, Andrew Hall, if you don't know Andrew, he is amazing. Like, dad, father, lover of Jesus. He's just a great friend to me. This guy is a baller and he wouldn't say it because he's all humble and stuff, but like he's amazing. He's a great friend to me. He's so good. Now you want to know one of the things I love the most about Andrew Hall? He's an encourager. He is an encourager. He is looking for things to tell you about yourself that just make you feel good. And I love that. He just encourages me. Like He's telling me something all the time. I'm not even asking. He's just like, you're such an amazing little, whatever it is, you know. It's something different all the time. I'm like, thanks, Andrew. You know, it just makes me feel good. You probably hear him here every week. He's the one always shouting amen and come on and preach it. You know how much that encourages me as I'm preaching the Word of God? Like, as I'm actually doing what I'm called and created to do and totally don't do it perfectly so many times. You know, as a pastor, even we think, you know, what if I said something wrong this week? What if, what if, I, said, what if I was the one that kept them from hearing about Jesus? What if I offended somebody? Because Lord knows I say some things, and especially in a live venue, I don't know if it's what's coming out. You know, I try to lean into the Spirit, and all these things are going through my mind. And whatever it is you do, you got these things coming through your mind, and then I have an Andrew Hall in my life who, as I'm actually doing what I'm created to do, even though I do it imperfectly, he's saying, come on, preach that. Oh, it makes me just want to... It makes, yeah, it makes me feel good. And I, I love it so much. This is what Andrew does for me. He's an encourager. He just does this for me and emboldens me. It builds it up. What are you talking about, Adam? What I'm saying is this. Encouragement is a game changer. It's a game changer. How we encourage people with our words that we speak can change a life, y'all. It reminds us who we are. It reminds us who our purpose is in and what our purpose is to be. Our words are so powerful. They can be used to build people up or they can be used to tear people down. I don't know about you, but instead of using my words to tear people down, I would rather be tearing down strongholds Come of in, 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 just inward looking the, the insecurity and deception and unbelief. I want to build people up 
with my words, not tear them down. Now, I can already guess you guys at home, surely not anybody in this room, surely not. Some of you are thinking, well, I'm not Andrew Hall. <laughs> I'm not wired like that. That's not who I am. That's not just something I do. I don't just go around encouraging people. It's not naturally how God made me. Well, neither was walking, but you kept trying that. Neither was talking the first few times you tried, but I bet you had some people around you who encouraged you when you were still Come sounding on. all silly, trying and saying some things that didn't even make sense. I bet you had people encouraging you, being like, oh yeah, that was good, and you just kept trying and kept trying, and it wasn't perfect, but you just kept trying until it got better. Encouragement is one of these things that's one of the best gifts you can give people. You say, I don't have anything to give. This thing is free. You can give it to anybody. And encouragement is one of the best gifts you can give to people. And it's something, if you don't do naturally, don't despair. You can grow in it. That's right. You can grow in this gift. You guys ever heard of um, five love languages? Yeah. Five love languages. Okay. So I usually don't like promote books in the pulpit that are not like biblical, but like outside of the Bible. Five Love Languages is one of the top 10 books I've ever read that have directly impacted my life. Like, long back story, won't, won't share it with you now, but in my mid-20s, I'm still looking for a wife. I'm desperate. I'm asking God. And I stumble across this book, and I'm like, oh. Like, it was just like revelation. Highly recommended at some other time. Go look it up. Gary Chapman is fantastic. I can recommend it. Christian guy um, is fantastic. But here's the premise of the book. The whole premise is that all of us are wired, like hardwired, to receive and give love in five basic ways. And one or two of these ways, or languages, we are naturally wired and more fluent in these languages. So you have five gifts. You have, um, you have um, quality time, physical touch, gifts, acts of service, words of affirmation. My top gift and language that I'm fluent in is words of affirmation. So for somebody like me, you just say, hey man, you're awesome. That goes so much further for me than like running an errand or trying to get me a tie on Father's Day. Don't do much for me, but you tell me how good I am or uh, you did great or you, you just, whatever, give me some good words. And man, I'm on like cloud nine. It, that's what works for me. So if you wanna express words, that's the way you do it instead of like doing acts of service or gifts for me. Y'all following so far? If you've not read the book, that's the whole premise of it. Now, part of why this book is so impactful is that it helps us recognize how we as individuals naturally give and receive love. But it also helps us realize how we don't naturally give and receive love. You might have wondered at some point, why can't they see that I love them? Why can't they tell? Why is it? Because I'm trying everything I know and he just can't tell that I love him. Or I've tried everything I know and she just doesn't get that I love her. Well, it might be because you're not speaking their language. You're not speaking the things that they're naturally gifted at giving and receiving. So like maybe you're loving your wife and you're trying to show her you love her and you're scratching all these things off the honey-do list and you're doing all these projects and all she wanted you to do was look at her and tell her she was pretty the whole time. Maybe you've been getting your husband all these gifts and trying to win his affection that way and all he wanted you to do was sit beside him on the couch and watch his favorite movie. You gotta understand how others are wired, not only yourself, so you can speak their language and make them feel loved. Why am I talking about this? Why am I talking about five love languages in a sermon? Because this, when we talk about giving encouragement and encouraging one another, you can say, that's not something I'm good at. And that's fine. You can say, this is not something I do naturally. And that is totally okay. But it's equally important to know that speaking these words of encouragement is something that you can grow in. Come on. It's something that you can learn to do more. Let's not use what we naturally do or don't do as an excuse anymore. Let's not look at the Enneagram and say, oh, look, see, this says who I am. So I'm just going to use this as an excuse now and you just have to take me the way I am. No, let's use all of these tools and assessments 
as instruments to help us grow into the fullest version of who God's created us to be. Because that version, that version that God sees when he looks at you, the version you're actually intended to be in your finished state, that version is actually intended to be a gift to the body of Christ, which means to all of those around you, you now become a blessing. You show up and people aren't running away because they're scared of what you're going to say to them and how you're going to bring them down. But they're like, oh, this person's going to build me up. That person loves Jesus. So I know even no matter what I'm going through, no matter what I faced or what I did yesterday or 10 years ago, I'm not going to be judged by them and put off by them in a way that I'm not going to be received by them, but I'm going to be loved. Because that person must love Jesus. That person must have good speech. That person must encourage me with their speech. Man, this room is quiet right now. Am I just talking to this room? Man, we're all called to build the body of Christ if you love Jesus. And one thing we're all called to do is be encouragers. It's right here. I could quote you more scripture, but I want to make this practical as we kind of come to the end today. I want to know if you actually want to know how to learn this. Do you want to grow in this? That's the question. Because you can. Do you want to grow in this? Sure. Just type, I want to grow. You know, if you're here, you could respond because you actually have, <laughs> we're talking about words. <laughs> Come on. Yeah. Talking about words. Yeah. You want to learn how to become a better encourager? Yeah. Come on, really yeah. simple. Yeah. I'm going to break it down. Really simple today. Practical. Are you ready? Yeah. You want to become a better encourager? If you think something good, say it. Really simple today. If you think something good, just say it. Just say it out loud. It's as simple as that. The moment that you think something positive about somebody else, you should tell them. Send them a text. DM them. Snapchat them. You could pick up your phone. You know, you could pick up your phone. Do y'all know that these things actually still call people? Do y'all know that? Come on. You could pick up your phone and talk to somebody and have an actual conversation on the phone, if you can't see them in person, because I know you're locked down in quarantine, I get it, but you could call them on the phone and talk to them and just be like, hey, I was thinking about you, and I just wanted to tell you how much I was thinking, blah, 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 or appreciate you, or whatever it is. Let somebody know. If you think it, actually say it. If you like writing, try a note, try a letter, put it in the actual mail. I love getting good mail. I don't hardly get good mail anymore. Send me a nice letter. It would make my day. Whatever you do, however you want to do it, just say what you're thinking if it's good. This is so simple, yet so powerful. I'll, I'll tell you this. It'll make your marriage better. Mm. Come on. Yeah. It'll make your friendship stronger. Mm -hmm. It'll let your kids know mm -hmm. that they're actually loved and cared for mm -hmm. and are doing something right. Mm -hmm. And it's not every single little thing they do can be done better or it's being done wrong. No, you're seeing them and kids need to hear this. Heck, adults need to hear this consistently. I see you and I just love you. You're doing something right. We need to hear this. Why? Because we all need encouragement. We all need to be built up. Hey, married folk watching in the room, talking to you, a few of you in here. If you're married now or if you want to be one day, I want you to listen up. This is really simple. When you're talking, hanging out with your spouse, I want you to encourage your spouse encourage that significant other that God has put in your life. When you talk to them, build them up. Like, it's simple, y'all. I can't tell you how much it makes me feel good when Chelsea actually points out something and just says, hey, I'll, you did this good, or I like this. It doesn't have to be big or earth-shattering. For her to just say, I see this in you, you did it good, it just makes my day. It, it makes me feel good, you know? And specifically to the ladies, since this is Father's Day, I'll talk to just the women for a moment, ladies. What you say to your husband matters. Mm -hmm. Let me say it again so I'll make sure you're hearing me. Ladies, what you say to your man, to him and about him, matters to us. Yes, we may not let on that it does. We may not act like it bothers us if we hear something bad that it just rolls off our back. But your words carry weight. They're heavy. And you can go one of two ways with this. You can encourage to build up, or you can let the words for that most important person in your life tear them down. Something I've witnessed as a pastor 
throughout my years, one of the, the things I've heard the most from women who love Jesus, and it, it's a sad reality, but this is the reality. I've heard so many women say, you know, my husband's just, he's just not a good spiritual leader. And the worst part about them making that statement is he's standing right next to her when she says it. I mean, what do you, what do you expect is going to happen when you say that? Are you expecting him to be motivated when that happens? Are you expecting him to man up because he heard you say it to somebody else? No, what that's going to do is it's going to break him down even more. It's going to cause him to doubt himself. It's going to put him on notice to everybody else, well, this guy's not a good leader for his own wife. If you actually want to see him grow, if you actually want to see growth, you know what you can do? Encourage him. Encourage him. And again, let's make this ultra practical. If, if you see him doing anything remotely spiritual, you need to celebrate the crap out of it. You just build him up. You want to see your man grow spiritually come on women i'm talking to you You know who i'm talking to this room even got extra quiet so i know this is good preaching <laughs> Whew, it's quiet in here let's say he says hey babe you want to get online and watch blueprint live this morning your response should be absolutely i'm so glad you reminded me that we should do that today if he's out in a in a restaurant and he stops to pray i'm talking encourage anything spiritual let's say it's a really horrible prayer your three-year-old could have done better like he <laughs> prays but he stops in a rest and people notice be like baby i'm so glad you stopped to do that you are leading us spiritually you better make a big stinking deal about it whatever he does if he brings up god just in the middle of any conversation i'm telling you you better like move heaven and earth to let him know you better make a stinking big deal babe you are a man of god you are leading us spiritually. Honey, I'm so glad how you do that. You just, you just, you, mm, you make me feel good when you do that. Whatever you need to do to encourage him, build him up. Hey, when you start in celebrating things, I guarantee you start seeing more of it. What you celebrate, you're going to see more Come of. On. You need to encourage that man in your life to become the person that God is actually calling him to be. And I know so many of you ladies are wanting to see who he's actually called to be. You have the power to help encourage That's it. Right. The power of life and death sits in your tongue. Use your words to encourage your man because God's called him to be something. Yeah. You can help craft it, help shape it into who God's created him to be. If anybody agrees in here, this would be a good time to say amen. So amen, because this is his world. Um, you know, ladies, I, this is some of your worlds too, but I'm just, I'm talking specifically to men today, trying to encourage them because his world is at work. The boss yells at him. He gets home. Hopefully you're not yelling at him, but maybe the kids yell at him. And his own mind very often is yelling at him. You have the power to be a source of strength in his life by the words that you speak. You can actually be a place of comfort and a place of refreshment and a place of encouragement to help him grow into who he's actually created to be. Because the sad truth is, this is where we often face our biggest battle. Even if we hear our boss or even our wives or the significant women in our lives or our kids, it's often in here. It's in our minds that we're facing the biggest battles, that we constantly hear the beat down from ourselves of discouraging words. And we start to focus on them and we go down this never ending funnel of just more discouragement and more discouragement. So this is where I want to wrap up today because I realize that's a reality for many of us. Let's look at Psalm 42. Psalm 42 verse five. When King David was in a really tough spot, when he had so many reasons to be cynical, to be down, to be depressed, I want to, I want to see how he deals with it. In Psalm 42, verse 5, he says this, and he repeats it two more places. He says, Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise Him my Savior and my God. I'm going to read it one more time. Just one verse. Psalm 42, verse 5. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise Him, my Savior and my God. See, David started preaching to himself. Come on. <laughs> 
He started encouraging himself when he was feeling down, when he was feeling depressed, when he felt all the things in the world around him starting to go crazy. What's going on in the world right now? Am I going to have a job right now? Am I good enough to keep it? Are my wife and kids going to want to be around me if I can't provide for them? And he starts to think all these things and go down this spiral. What's his response? He says, put your hope in in God. He says, why are you downcast, oh my soul? Why are you so depressed? Maybe you want to ask yourself that question. Why are you so anxious right now? Why are you so afraid? I suggest to you, it's where you're putting your hope. David says, here's the solution. Put your hope in God. Come on. That's it. Put your hope in God. David's solution here, see what he didn't say. He didn't say, you're the best, David. Nobody's got nothing on you, David. You are God's gift to humanity, David. <laughs> Nobody can compete with you. It wasn't all that. You can do this in your own power. I can do this in my own strength. No, he says, put your hope in God, for I will get praise in. This is where I find my hope. This is where I find my strength. It's not in myself. It's not in your opinion of me. It's in who God said that I am. That's where my hope comes from. In the God of the universe that created me, that gives me life and gives me purpose, even when you don't like me, even when I don't like me, God has a purpose for me. He starts preaching to himself. I can imagine if he actually lived now, he'd be saying, no weapon formed against me will prosper. God has plans for me. He's saying, I'm chosen and redeemed. I've been called and set free. I am called by God and Jesus Christ to actually do something in this world. See, even when nobody else is encouraging you, you got to encourage yourself in God. I'm going to say it one more time. Even when nobody else is encouraging you, fathers, People, your wife's not, your husband's not, your friends aren't. Your friends come in and beat you down. Even when nobody else is encouraging you, you got to encourage yourself in God. You can remind yourself, my sins have been forgiven. As far as the east is from the west, God has chosen me. I'm now seated in heavenly places with God. I am called a son or daughter of the king. Yes. That is my identity. See, you got to preach to yourself. You got to encourage yourself. You say, if God is for me, who can be against me? Right. God is working all things out for me, for my good, because I love him. He's the rock on which I stand. I can do all things who give him strength. You just got to speak it. Why downcast on my soul? Why so disturbed within me? See, I still got a God who loves me, has created me, and has plans for me. And I believe I'm going to see his goodness in the land of the living. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, would you make us a people of encouragement? Would you let today be a day where fathers across this world, everybody listening, whether they're in India, whether they're in Pakistan, whether they're right here in Middle Tennessee, all across the globe, Lord, let us be a people who are encouraging. Let us be encouraged knowing who you've called us to be in you. It's not to be the tail, but to be the head. It's not to be struck down is not to be an anxious people. It's to be a people that are full of faith, that are full of hope. Even in the midst of terrible circumstances, God, you call us yours. And that is where my hope is found. Make us a people of faith that can encourage one another in faith. Even when we're not feeling so great, Lord, make us a people who can speak hope and speak truth and speak light into the situations in which we are walking. Let us rise up to be your people. Let us rise up to bring strength to your body. In the name of Jesus, amen. 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 Hey, if you're watching right now, I want to encourage you. If you don't know Jesus today, and maybe you are watching with a friend or somebody shared this link for you, and you say, hey, all this sounds nice. I, I like encouragement too. <laughs> you know, everybody does. I want to invite you to the best decision you can make. I want to encourage you today that no matter what you've done or why you might feel like you're disqualified or God doesn't like you or love you enough, let me tell you, He looks at you right now and He sees you and He loves you. You have a good Father, your Heavenly Father, who is looking at you right now in whatever situation you're in, and He absolutely adores you. He wants a relationship that's real with you. And He made a way for that to happen. Because the truth is, you and me both and everybody in this room, everybody watching, we're all jacked up. 
we have all sinned and messed up. And sin separates us from God. That's anything that's wrong, anything that's bad. And the truth is your sin deserves death. That's what the Bible says. But God's so good that he gave his only son, Jesus, a perfect sacrifice. He came to this earth. He lived a perfect life, sinless. And he gave his life on the cross so that he took all sin, yours, mine, everybody's, for all time upon himself. And by believing and confessing that he is your savior, confessing your sins, the Bible says if you believe in your heart that Jesus is the Christ, that he is Lord, and you confess with your mouth that you'll be saved. I want to give you an opportunity to do that this morning, wherever you're at. Everybody in this room is going to pray out loud together with you. Everybody where you're sitting, if you're by yourself in your car or you're with three or four people, don't be awkward. If you've prayed this before, just pray it again. I'm going to give you the words, but you got to give them the meaning. And I'm going to give you an opportunity to begin a relationship with God today. Just repeat after me. Dear God, in Jesus' name, I come to you. Please forgive me for my sins. Forgive me where I've fallen short. I turn and follow you. I believe on the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Come be my Lord. Come be my Savior. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, if you just prayed that prayer, you just made the best decision of your life. <laughs> Welcome to the family of God. It's, uh, it's the best place to be. And it's the first of many steps you'll take in now growing in your relationship with God, getting to know Him more, uh, starting to get into His Word, which is the Bible. If you don't have a Bible, uh, email us at info at blueprintchurch.tv. We'd love to just get you a Bible. Uh, we have our online resources with our app, Blueprint Church. You can search that um, in the app store, whatever you use, and you can find a free Bible within that app. But we just want to celebrate with you today. Text that number that's on your screen so we can follow up with you because that is a first step you just made. Now the angels in heaven, it says in the Bible, are rejoicing right now because a sinner came to know God. And this is your first step. You keep continuing to grow now in your relationship, and we want to do that with you. So text that number so we can know who you are. And everybody watching today, as we close out, I just want to encourage you to be an encourager. Be an encourager. We can all grow in this. What would happen if the people of God actually started to encourage one another? What would happen if people of faith would actually be the light in the world, would actually, with our words, start to build each other up? And yes, we don't not acknowledge what's going on in our world around us, but we speak to the truth that is, and that is God is good that he has a plan for you, and that he loves you. What would happen? I just want to challenge you with that. And specifically to dads today, or, or people who have a dad, that means all of you. Biological, adoptive, spiritual. I know this is harder and some easier than others, but I want you to reach out to your dad today. Even if you can only think of one good thing to share or say, encourage him. Just let him know that he's loved. I don't know if you know the impact it could possibly have today. So do that. Enjoy your Father's Day. We love all of you guys. I can't wait to see you back here next week at 945. Have a great Father's Day. Have a great week. Thank you all so much for watching. Make sure to follow us at Blueprint Church Nashville on all social media platforms to keep up with what's going on. And parents, don't forget to head over to blueprintchurch.tv slash online to have some kids church with your kids too. We hope you all have a great week and happy Father's Day. We'll see you all right back here next Sunday at 9.45 a.m.